All right, we just talked about the different personality types and how people can enjoy fighting games, and that was an important galaxy brain play on my part, because before I tell a new player what to do, we first have to solve the very first and most important issue, how to have fun. Don't let anyone tell you differently. The point of fighting games is to have fun. Sure, some people might get so attached to the community or the competition or pros or uh, who have a public identity connected to competing that they might play fighting games they don't even really like just to be part of the current um, game that people are playing. And one could argue that even if they dislike the game they're playing, they're still overall having fun because of the community or competition. But um, that's high-minded bullshit. That's not the point. Fun does not come from competition. Competition comes from fun. Just look at something like speedrunning. Super Mario Sunshine was not a game made with competition in mind, but because people found the game to be so much fun to push the limits of speed thanks to its incredibly dense array of movement controls and precision that even to this day there are techniques people still find too difficult to do in practical runs. They practice and practice doing it until they're usable. Yeah, people find it fun. So they made a competition out of it. Fighting games have to be fun first and foremost. No one would give a shit if the players and spectators weren't having a good time. And yes, it's true that no one hates fighting games more than fighting game players, but at the end of the day, there has to be a genuine appeal. So the first thing you need to do, uh, if uh, you want to check this out or any other fighting game for a bit and give it a fair shake, the first thing you need to do is find your fun. That's step one, find your fun. If you have a good understanding of your own taste, that helps. It'll, it'll be easier to do what I've already talked about. Now, the type of person who isn't going to want to sit around for half an hour or more to learn the basic systems and concepts probably wouldn't be watching this video in the first place. But if you, fair viewer, are watching this on behalf of someone you'd like to get into fighting games, keep in mind how you might entice someone who will be turned off by jumping straight into these boring, dry-ass explanations of shit. So, if you want to get invested in a narrative uh, and see some cool, engaging shit, I'll leave some links below down in the description for some of my recommendations. Maybe you'll want to do some story mode or just learn about more about the characters or whatever, get more attached to the, the anything. I don't know, man, how that works. Uh, I'd probably just start looking up stuff online, since a fighting game certainly isn't going to give you a comprehensive idea of a character's history or much else. Watch the, the Abbey animation tutorials, those are good. Maybe you want to start clearing checkboxes so you complete some of the trials, combo challenges in the game, survival mode things, uh, things like that. In-game trials are often really bad for new players because anything that you don't pick up on immediately, the game will not help you figure it out. So, let's get started with some basic explanations of this video game. I mentioned that to a lot of people, jumping straight into dry explanations of things is really boring and often difficult for people to see the point of it. In this sense, fighting games are a lot like a history as a subject. Now, I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not as talented, a uh, talented enough storyteller or entertainer to pull this off myself, but I will attempt to broach this topic in the same manner as I was taught by our proud autistic warrior hero, Munchie Shatsky. Do not click off this video! I know what it looks like, I know, I know. I fucking understand, I know what it's like to be like, oh, huh, wow, history is the sort of thing you learn about in school, or you see on the YouTube recommended page, 10 minute video, extra credits. Hey, let me talk to you in this really high pitched voice and give you the most bare bones, fucking basic bitch ass details humanly possible to receive into your Brain. So first things first, let's get some context. For quick reference, let's see the game in action. At some level, a player has to have an idea of what they want before they're motivated to learn how to do it. This is a match we'll come back to, but this is one of my favorite bouts in recent memory in this game. Now, a new player has no actual chance of looking at any of this footage of top-level players and mimicking all of the skills being displayed. New players aren't at a level where they can understand all these skills and interactions and broad tendencies. The first thing I want to say, and this goes for learning basically anything, is Dunning-Kruger. You've all heard about the concept of Dunning-Kruger, and that is the idea that if someone goes from knowing nothing at all about a subject to knowing a, a bit about a subject, enough that they have some idea of it, they, think, they suddenly think that they're an expert, when in fact they still aren't comprehending the rest of the iceberg beneath them. So when you learn something new, remember these two very important things. One, you are not special. Someone, uh, millions of other people 
probably have gone through the exact same experience that you have. And two, there is always more to learn. So, we've seen some high-level footage. We have a basic idea of how the game looks when it's being played well. The arc of our, of our hero's journey is, I want to do that to someone now. So, would you, what would give you the biggest thrill right away? Do you want to start beating people as soon as possible? Do you want to do some of that cool shit that you've seen other players do? Do you want, like, a low-tension, low-anxiety, chill goal to reach? Like a beginner objective, beginner level? No problem. I have, I have a path for each of you. For the chill completionist, let's do a basic lesson. There are other handy resources that have been around forever, like Geef's Gym, that uses this basic approach to teaching Street Fighter, where they teach a simple lesson and they have an achievable little little mini game for, for players to try. But we won't be able to do anything like that until we understand how to use training mode. Alright, so, uh, what am I recording? Uh, training mode settings, right, so you come into options here. I turn off all my sound settings because my PC blares it out. But, um, other settings. So one of the most default, this is the Steam version, which I believe has slightly different shortcut settings than the, uh, uh, PS4 version. But, um, I just generally put restart value. There's tons of incredibly helpful ones here. Like, I would put replay serve status, but it doesn't let me do that on the Steam config. So, um, yeah, I turn on restart battle. Training. Alright, so at a basic level, my restart battle is configured to my, like, left stick. I'm using a, a um, what, DualShock 4 regular controller. So I just click it in, and uh, that resets my position over and over, which is very handy. Uh, I can set the starting position to be reset to there, and then to there on the left corner. So yeah, this is, I'll run through the options. So the first basic settings... We have character and stage select, version select, you'll probably do a lot, or you can change the V-skill and V-trigger for both characters. Starting position, you'll adjust left side, right side, you'll want to take advantage of, especially early on when you're practicing inputs on both sides. Attack data on, so by default when you start up the game it looks like this. I turn on attack data and key display. Frame advantage and color looks incredibly ugly and it makes it hard to see what's going on, so I don't really like using it. But uh, you can apply it uh, for like a quick visual reference of blue means uh, the other character has the advantage, red means uh, yeah. blue is the person with advantage, red is disadvantage. But you can get all that information generally just on the on the frame data, so the the attack data that shows up in those boxes there you have the damage stun and stuff for each move but most importantly you have the frames that count off it'll tell you the end result for whatever action that you took and it's dynamic too so if I do fireball point blank like this oh it's minus six but if I come back here it's plus one it registers the um, the fact that it's uh, connecting with him later um, you know, it, it tells me at what point, uh, he blocked it late enough that I'm actually at the advantage. And, uh, key display just, um, records a log of all your inputs. Command list, you might look up, uh, when you're, when you're early on, this shows you the inputs. Uh, unique attacks, so your, your special, your unique, um, command normals like this. Alright, so yeah, stage status, this is uh, much easier to do if you have a command input for it in the shortcut settings, but yes, you can also go anywhere, like if I do this heavy kick and I click save status, if I go anywhere else and I pause and I put replay save status, it'll take me back to that exact moment where I did the heavy kick on block in that situation. So, if you have a command normal or something that you can uh, record it, and the, or the main thing you need is the replay. To, to, to be on a command, which is which is why it sucks that it... But let me demonstrate what I'd, I'd be able to do. Alrighty, I've applied a save status to right when his heavy... When Ken's heavy Tatsu is right here. So I can replay it over and over. Yeah. 
and practice different stuff on it. Uh, as you can tell, I don't use this a ton because I just generally keep it on my um, restart battle, so I don't get to use it that much. Alright, so in the dummy settings, it should by default look like this. Uh, it'll probably look at like no re recovery right away. There's not that much value to doing that. You would, should probably put it on normal recovery or back recovery um, because it'll be more attuned to real. Most of the time, your opponents aren't going to be doing no recovery. So, no recovery looks like that. Normal recovery, the normal recover, and then back recovery, they roll back. So you have your standing, crouching, and jumping states that you can put them in. Jump will just have him do this endlessly. Crouching state is uh, useful for um, uh, testing various things like uh, your your heavy kick whiffs on crouchers. Uh, you have certain moves that don't reach if they're um, standing. Like that, I think. Yeah, that, that reaches if they're on crouching because they're slightly wider. Guard, so first attack only. They block the first attack, and y you can use this to test frame traps and such. And distances and ranges. Like, oh, that doesn't reach, but... That doesn't reach, but I'm plus six, so maybe I can get, like, a... Slight walk-up. I don't think so. Whatever. Anyway, so... After first attack means that, oh, uh, you can set up, like, oh... Knockdown, I want them to block in this situation. So this is handy to set up situations where you want the opponent to block after a certain knockdown or a certain situation to see what will happen next. Guard all. Obviously, they just block everything. Random guard is handy for looking for certain things like to react to whether or not they're blocking or standing, but that's something you can practice later. In general, you would do like, oh, just do this block string, and then practice confirming it into a combo if it hits. Like so. So, all very useful settings. Switch guard direction, I don't really mess with that very much. Recovery, counter hit state, you can turn on um, counter hit so you get um, counter hit combos. Stun, you can do no stun so that you can continually test things over and over without worrying about the stun breaking whatever you're trying to do. This can be handy sometimes. Stun on next attack. So you can see and set up a stun sequence or something. <coughs> now recording situations is very useful. So interval setting, this is just annoying. I would set it to one. Interval setting just literally refers to um, like how long it makes you wait when you record something. It, it is not particularly this. Maybe you want to turn on wake up slowdown or not if, you, if it feel like, but if you turn off wake up slowdown, um, it'll be more true to real life, so it'll feel more natural once you get used to it. So this is record wake-up options. This is record guard recovery options. So if I set them to block, whatever. Okay, so wake-up options. And I hit a button when he wakes up. That didn't count. It has to be at the right timing, and it'll say reversal on the screen. That means that it went through. It's kind of silly that it'll take the animation but not happen. So now he is set, if I turn that on, when he wakes up, so any situation, even if he were to do like a normal, no recovery, when he wakes up, he'll do that action. Which means that you can practice hitting him, because if I do like, oh, mistime it, do something too slow or anything, oh, I'm going to get hit out. So I need to practice. 
hitting him at the right timing. So set wake up attacks. And you can record him to do like invincible reversals on wake up as well. Like so. Guard recovery action is also incredibly useful for um, testing like uh, uh, all sorts of different stuff. I mean, I use this basically all the time. So if you want to test like your frame trap works out, so it's like this is plus two. So you want to make sure that works. Oh, it does. He he's he's attacking with this, and my attack beats him. But you can also use this to um, trigger certain reactions. So it's like if you're testing how your your buttons beat his buttons in 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 this close range in the neutral that you're going to be playing, you can also do that as well. I'll record like a him to do a crouch medium kick and then I can trigger it in a bunch of different situations to create this so if I do like that that's gonna be minus one so if I'm in a minus one situation and he presses that button how do our moves interact So you can test it out from different amounts of plus frames and see if you can stuff him out on startup. See, you can see like, oh, this crouching medium punch, his attack goes under, but if I do this crouching medium kick, I still beat him. So yeah, use guard recovery all the time. From there we also have CPU settings, if you want to like turn the CPU on, items. Player controlled if you have another controller, and playback recording. So mainly you're just going to use dummy and playback recordings. Uh, I generally turn this to off, uh, because if I have it on, it will tell me which recording is being done. See it says number three there, and I want to be able to like try to react to this situation. So it's like I've recorded a couple of things already here. Let's see what I've recorded. So if I wanted to record something, I'll do uh, as soon as I press a button, it'll start recording. And when I hit pause, it'll finish it. So if I record and I jump into blocking, then I'm going to turn both of these on. and practice reacting with my projectile invincible move. So both of those things are going at random. So that I have to just react and identify the correct one that I'm looking for. And yeah, that's how you use most of your settings. Uh, you just have the gauge settings. I just set them basically all to here for most of the time and just forget about it. So the basic goal of a match of Street Fighter is obviously to reduce your opponent's HP to zero. But contrary to what you might expect, the HP is only a very minor factor throughout most of a round. One thing to keep in mind is that your meter is retained between rounds, so even if you lose a round, you might have kept some meter for the next round to give you an advantage, or you might have blown everything and still lost, so that's pretty, pretty cringe, bro. But as I was saying, the biggest factor in most fighting games is the situation. It's like a it's like a JoJo fight, you know? Like, watch this. This is the max damage I can inflict upon my opponent in this situation. So that'd be damage off of that. And 
and that's damage in that situation. How far away from the opponent am I? What state uh, me and my opponent are currently in? The distance to the corner? These are the factors that determine the outcome of a match. These dictate everything. And I do mean everything you do. Think of playing in one situation as a completely different video game from playing in another situation. And this doesn't just extend to what is physically possible in the game's mechanics, but the psychology of thinking and, and uh, being alert and predicting your opponent as well. The brain recognizes and responds to different situations differently. Even extremely specific situations with minor differences might result in a different instinctive response from you or from your opponent than other technically similar situations. Pay attention to the situation and all its variables. That is the most important thing in a fighting game. This is what most players struggle with right away playing against real opponents. Well, for one, it's kind of a universal concept that no one really likes crowd control in video games. If you've ever played League of Legends or like any other game where your character can get like yanked or silenced or anything like that, that's crowd control. When when you have no ability to get do moves in an RPG, when uh, you're you're locked down in in like uh, Overwatch or something, that's crowd control, man. That's a huge part of pretty much all fighting games. Not by design, not inherently to the genre, but that's just how fighting games tend to get made. Technically, you could do a fighting game with less crowd control in it, but whatever. When you're getting hit by an enemy, when you're in hit stun, when you're knocked into the air, meaning you're in a juggle state, when you're on the ground in a knockdown state, these are all forms of crowd control, by definition. They put you into a unique state in which a large portion of your toolkit is no longer available. Think about, like, in a shooter like Overwatch, you can run and around however you want. You're only barred from playing when you get shot dead. If you get shot by an enemy, you take damage, but you're still allowed to shoot back at the same time that they're shooting you, you know? You can do all your shit that you want. You're not crowd-controlled that much. You can still input however you might die, but you can still control your character while you're dying. Not the case in fighting games. This is what turns people off if they aren't guided properly around this. You see some cool shit, maybe you learn how to do that cool shit, jump into a match, you can't do any of that stuff because you just keep getting hit out of the thing you're trying to do that you practiced. That sucks, that doesn't feel good, man. This is why it's important to recognize that each situation you're in is akin to a totally different game. And I'll explain why as we go. I'll explain frames in a second, but basically, just like any other game, there is recovery to moves you take. In a shooter, if you reload, you don't have access to your shooty bang for a second. In a third-person hack-and-slash game, if you swing a weapon, there's a second before you can move freely or attack again as the sword finishes through its swing. The same is true for fighting games. Any action that you take, even movement-based actions, carries some sort of risk. Every action has a given cost. Uh, a given cost of how long you'll be out of commission for and in what way, what options you are taking out of your own commission. How long you'll be defenseless for, how vulnerable you are, and there's essentially an essence of turn-taking. It's not that hard to wrap your brain around. Like, just think of, like, a, a lifelike situation. Like, oh, if someone is holding their gun to John Wick's head, and, and oh, John Wick's gun, he, it's on the floor. It stands to reason that if John Wick tried to go for his gun on the floor to shoot the bad guy, he would fucking lose, because he's at a time disadvantage. The gun would just go off on his head, and he'd be dead. So what does John Wick do? Oh, he does some some dumb karate action movie bullshit and uses his arm to like swat the gun away from his head like that that fucking tiktok guy and and then he goes for his gun or just like punches the guy or whatever i want you to think of it like this whose turn is it who is at the time advantage in this western pistols at dawn drawing contest who will get their bullet in their opponent's face sooner based on where their guns are right now if you have your gun aimed at your opponent as they come around the corner just blast them if they have their gun to your head, you have to do the dumb action movie bullshit to get out of that situation. That's where blocking comes in. Everyone hates blocking because it's crowd control, you know? It's kind of insane how much gamers as like a species hate the very concept of blocking. I think this is just due to a general trend in like, um, like uh, RPGs in blocking not being very well designed and very useful and it feels like wasting a turn a lot of the time as opposed to being what you use when you don't have a luxury of a turn. But yeah, I want you to think of blocking as like the, the John Wick cool guy move with the gun to your head. You recognize that you're in danger and you take the action that will reduce that danger 
so that you can be the danger to your opponent. After that, it all comes down to when you're starting out. It's just learning when you have the gun on your enemy and when they have their gun to your head. So, when boring assholes that Stephen King makes fun of on Twitter talk about frame data, this is what they mean. Uh, SFV is uh, 60 frames per second, so one frame is just a unit of time. Just like a second or a minute or something. A 60th of a second is a frame. Every move has detailed information about how long it takes to attack, uh, how long it will attack for, and how long it'll take to recover and let you do other things, including defend. And this is the case for, like, most video games, but um, you have to actually know this information for fighting games most of the time. That time is measured in frames as the standard. Let's look at each of those concepts. Uh, recovery, block stun, and hit stun. If the left character does this move, and the right character does this move, and they both attack with the same skill, you know, as soon as possible, the one who did the faster move that recovers sooner wins. You know? That isn't rocket science, so forgive me if I breeze through this a little bit. There's other people that can explain frame data if you're still confused. Each move has a form of crowd control called hit stun and block stun. You know, if they connect with their opponent, in regardless of the situation, they will apply some sort of crowd control, which triggers when hitting the opponent, when they're blocking or not blocking or just not able to block if they're trying to, like if they're punishable or something. Now, the moves pause the game a little bit when they touch the opponent. See that? That's called hit stop. It has a few purposes in the why fighting games have this, but just accept that as, like, this is the way things work, okay? That extra stoppage means that the move takes a little bit longer to recover uh, when they make contact with the enemy. But that's a little bit more technical. The point is, they apply crowd control to the opponent on hit and on block, and each move has a an amount of block stun and an amount of hit stun. It applies. Some moves have a lot of crowd control on hit, but only a little bit of crowd control on block, like most of the crouching heavy kicks in the game. But the end result is, when you take the amount of time it takes for the move to recover, and you subtract the amount of time it takes for the opponent to recover from the hit stun and the block stun, you end up with a number. Sometimes the number is positive, uh, sometimes it's negative. Some moves recover fast when applying a lot of crowd control, meaning that they're uh, plus on block. You know, you probably heard that term. This just means that even after attacking, after, 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 after you block, you know, after getting the gun knocked out of your hand, they still have the advantage. Imagine a bad guy had two guns on John Wick's hand. You have to block twice, you know? Uh, one in each hand, and, like, also a sniper rifle aiming at him from, like, some guy in the back. Johnny Boy is gonna need to do a lot of blocking those disadvantages before he can effortlessly murder them. So, one block deals with the first gun, the enemy is still plus. Block again, knock the second gun away, still plus. Then John Wick, like, picks up an ashtray or something to block the sniper, or he dies under a sofa. I don't really care. This metaphor is so fucking stupid. The point is, sometimes, in fact, a lot of the time, the enemy's attacks still leave them at an advantage in terms of the immediate situation. You know, you block, but you still don't have the luxury to do the things that you want to do. But don't be discouraged. A fighting game match is made up of situations just like this. Some in your favor, some not. A bullet to the head will kill you, but it'd be bad if you didn't handle the situ so it'd be bad if you didn't handle the situation correctly. But even if you're in a bad spot, you're, you're John Wick, bro. You have so much plot armor. You can do your job, get out of this tight spot, and then bring it to your opponent no problem. So the sooner you accept that, you can't do what you want to all the time in a real match. The sooner you accept that, and that you need to act according to the situation, the better for you, and the more you can actually get to do what you really want to do. For context, let me show you what can happen if you just try to do as you just please, as you feel like in a situation where it's not appropriate for you to do whatever. You bleed, man, so don't do that. Don't, don't run in the halls. Don't do what you want in a situation where you shouldn't. You have to know what options you do still have when most of your regular options are no good. After you understand the situations, you have a little bit more leniency. But it's all about applying more nuances to those concepts. After, of course, just a fat, like, textbook worths of learning how everything works and which situations are plus or minus or really, really, really minus, which is referred to as being punishable. 
uh, which I've already shown you how to test in training mode yourself. So all that being said, when you start the match, you're both in the middle of the screen. You want to get us to a situation where you're at the advantage. In an immediate sense, that means being plus in front of the opponent. In a slightly less immediate sense, that means getting them to have their back against the wall by pushing them closer to the corner. And in a broader sense, it means having a better assortment of tools by managing your resources, like your meter and your V-gauge, better than them. Trading them well for other situations, other sorts of situational advantages, that's the game. You want to create advantages. So, I said a little bit ago that you should think of each situation as its own game. Well, now I'm going to cover very broadly some of the types of situations you'll run into often, and how you can, uh, how you can make that game fun. After all, if you only want to do cool combos, but you're not in a situation where you can land cool combos most of the time, well, therefore you won't be having fun. You need to have something to do. You know, you need to have a goal to strive for in every situation. You can't necessarily force the situations that you want to happen, especially when you're a beginner. So, you have to figure out how to make fun of every situation. So, when you get knocked on your ass or any other situation where you've learned that the opponent has the frame advantage on you, their gun on your cranium, this is the basic defensive scenario. Some characters have unique methods of applying offense and threatening you, but in general, most of the cast, you're looking at a situation where they're probably going to attack you, so blocking is the go-to safest choice. The basic guess against most characters is that if they're close enough to throw you, the throw is really fast. It's too fast to react to with your human, stupid, lame-ass eyes. And obviously, throwing beats blocking. Most people call this situation RPS, or a form of rock, paper, scissors. Here's how it goes really quick. Most basic defensive situation. Important for you to know. Generally speaking, the fastest attacks in this game are three frames. They come out in three frames. Technically, there are a couple of moves that hit in just two frames, but those are very rare and they don't happen very much and they don't affect the game that much. So just ignore them for now. Three frames is the magic number. Now this is a pretty big dividing line between diff the characters in this game. Some characters' fastest attacks are three frames, others have slightly slower four framers as their fastest attacks. Let me show you a quick example of this. Alrighty, so Gil and his brother Urian I have some pretty similar attacks in certain circumstances, but their frame data is pretty different. So Gil has a three-framer and Yurian doesn't. So if I create this situation on block, where if I get hit by that, it's minus five for me, but if I am if I block it, zero on both. So when I block this, this situation is completely even between both of us. Neither one of us has an advantage, inherently. So, let's test the situation. If I hit my light kick, which is four frames, it'll be the same as his crouch jab, which is his fastest move. So we both hit it at the same time, we get a trade. But, if I do my crouch jab, I, uh, yeah, I get the hit. It's just faster. Three frame remove. Now, if you ever want to know the frame date of a move to see how fast it is or anything else about it, you can easily find that information online. Just type in like SFE frame date or something, or look at like um like Fat Online, whatever it's called. Um, there's multiple sites that have really good reliable frame data. Uh, so clearly, this situation this gives an advantage to characters who have access to that faster three framer button. In any case, it's definitely good to know which characters have three framers. Uh, so you can go for some of those some of those situations with slightly bigger gaps because your opponent's just that that extra frame slower. Anyways, back to this basic defensive situation. Every character has a normal throw, forwards and backwards, and that throw is five frames. We mentioned how bigger moves have priority over smaller moves if they hit at the exact same time. Throws are king. They will beat uh, everything that they trade with unless it's throw invincible. But um, so in general. If the opponent is plus two or more, that's enough for them to throw you free of charge, if they're close enough, of course. It's also important to note that some characters just flat out reach further than others when they throw. So, in this situation, from this distance, Dan's throw doesn't reach. 
but mine will. In this situation, you can break the throw by inputting throw. It's called throw teching. Or you can do anything that's throw invincible, which we'll touch on when we expand our options and character specific options. Ignore that for now. So at first glance, it seems like you can either block or throw break. If you hit throw on wake up and they hit you, they'll, 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 they'll hit you clean out. It's much worse than if you guess wrong the other way. Let me show you the kind of risk reward we're talking about here. All right, so in this situation, let's uh, record guard recovery actions to do uh, throw tech. And I'm gonna set it to guard recovery actions on, replay interval setting, adjust the waiting frames between the ending of the guard animation and the thingy. So if I have it do like zero, I do that and then he immediately throws. But if I put it at like, I don't know, like 10, he waits 10 frames and then he does it. So this is handy because people don't usually tech immediately. They're going to tech after like a couple of frames. Like that. So if I throw him, the risk is there and he gets up and we're about this range from each other. I'm only plus 5. I really can't, as Karen, I really can't do much. Maybe I could go for something like that, but I really don't have the advantage to do anything. I just get 130 damage. If I go for a back throw, I get 150 damage, and not much better of a situation for myself, because I'm only plus 2. Versus the risk of... something like that if you uh, guess on the tech and uh, you're wrong. Honestly, beating throws isn't even really that important until you get to players that you can't beat through other means. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's expand our fucking galaxy brains a little bit. You're allowed to break a throw for quite a long time after the throw touches you. Not long enough for human reactions, but long enough for you, your hands to do some funky stuff. It's all still, like, uh, under 15 frames or so. So the most immediate defensive technique to start practicing and training is to do your cool John Wick shit on defense, and we call this the delay tech. It's pretty easy to do, but um, in stressful situations, it can be messed up. So this is your first real exercise for all you completionists out there. Run this drill. All right, so you can do this with a lot of characters. I think Lucy is one of the ones that... um. She can get two tick throws back-to-back uh, -back without having to do any movement. So I would record here, just her doing, um... Alright, so those should be all of them. So this one is... One light kick into throw. This one is... The jump in into throw. This one is... Two light kicks into throw, probably. And this one is... Another hit into a walk-up throw. And then this one is just a full string. So if we turn on all of them, we can uh, start teching. So you can see my inputs there. Do some delay tech. So block first. See the walk up. Missed it there. And so on. So just practice that until you get the timing right. You can try it with other characters. You can, uh, yeah. Alright, so here we have like two different variations. We have one with a crouch jab and then we have one with um crouching medium punch instead.
So because of the different variation and the different timing that you have to wait for the medium, it uh, adds more dynamics to it and it's, it's good to practice. This allows you to cover both the meaty, which means that the attack that hits you, the strike that hits you as you get up, and the, the throw, you know? However, it still has some risk. Alrighty, so here's our rotation of options. So if the opponent just goes for a, a throw, here's the sort of stuff we can do. So we can tech it, by hitting the throw within a certain amount of time. We can backdash it. We can jump out. If we throw tech, so, so this is the shimmy option, if we throw tech, we're going to get hit. But if we backdash, we're fine. If we jump back, we're fine. And if we attack, we're more or less fine. And if we stay blocking, we're fine. If we V-shift, we might be fine. So this is uh, going for a direct attack, a media attack. If we block, we're f kind of fine. I mean, we're still in pressure, but... If we backdash, we get hit. If we jump, we get hit. Holding up. If we attack, we get hit. If we delay tech, we're fine. And if we V-shift, we're fine. This is the delay button option. So if I do a delay tech at a certain timing, I get counter hit anyways. So they have to match their delay to my delay. And because you don't always delay at the same time, it's kind of difficult to hit me doing this. But So if I just do my delay tech a little bit earlier, or a little bit later, I won't get hit by this, but if I delay tech right at the right time around there where his delayed button is, it will hit me. So there is a risk to that. Backdash gets out of delayed buttons. Jump back gets out of delay buttons. V-shift might get out, depends on if they react to your V-shift. It's still a risk though. And then you have character specific options that beat delay teching like uh, this move that goes airborne, but it'll also hit me if I backdash. So for the rotation of options, delay teching beats that one. So delay teching beats throws and meaty buttons. Just blocking beats shimmies and buttons. And backdashing beats shimmies and throws. So, between his three options of like the main three options that he might be going for, any option that you take will beat two of his options. Now the most likely scenario is that they're going to do buttons, because buttons like we already covered, beat, tend to beat the most things and are the most rewarding for the opponent. So most of the time they're going to be doing the option that beats backdashing. So even though backdashing does beat two of the options, it's still the option that probably carries the most risk uh, for just deciding to do it uh, uh, on a whim. So generally speaking you can commit to just blocking, just delay teching, and then if your opponent is very insistent on either going for the throw or going for the shimmy, both of those will lose to backdashing, and you can start implementing that to force your opponent to start doing more buttons that you can beat with delay teching and such. So, using our fucking big fucking brains, we can create a chart of the options we have here, and the various risks that come with those options. Uh, 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 and, and we can look at, like, the statistics of how risky each thing is, right? To make sense of what just is the smarter option to do. Once we incorporate two more universal mechanics, backdash and v-shift, which exists in this version of the game. So, to simplify all this down, you, your basic guess, uh, you have when the opponent can throw you, is you can wait patiently and block, 
just block and hit nothing else, which beats attacks, uh, which will beat an attack, a delayed attack, and a shimmy, and most other, like, anti-throw moves, but it will lose to throws. You can delay tech, which beats attacks and throws, but loses to, like, uh, shimmies and, um, perfectly timed d delay buttons. Again, it's hard for a delay button to catch a, a delay tech, but, um, it, it, ca it is a risk. It can happen. You can do an attack yourself with your fastest move, which loses to their attack, loses to their throw, but if you attack and they throw you, it's not any worse for you than if they, um, than if you blocked and they throw you, you know? Like, um, so you won't get counter hit by their throw. Their throw just deals a set amount of damage. So if their throw is going to get, if you're accepting that you're going to get thrown regardless, if you're fairly confident that they're going to throw you, that they're not going to meet you with an attack, but, um, you know, you're maybe worried about a shimmy or something, you might as well wake up with a button if, you, if you're like, if you really don't want to tech. Because uh, if your button beats out their throw, if they mistime it or something, that's just more reward for you. But, uh, don't do that early on. Don't, do not be that guy that your defensive option is just to attack back. That's, um, that's gonna get you killed way more often, especially early on. You have to be pretty confident and knowledgeable of the situations to, um, and knowledgeable of your opponent's personality tendencies in order to go for something like that. Uh, most players at a low level will either attack you or throw you. No fancy shit. They'll probably just strike or throw, or they'll probably, like, just walk straight in your face and then throw you. You can backdash, which beats some throws. Uh, it beats throws, and it beats some of the other fancy options, but it loses to attacking. But uh, backdashes, because they get airborne faster than other moves, backdashing is more likely to at least not get you that damaged for for getting hit you know uh if you if you're airborne within like two or three frames or something um so if you're con if you're not if you think that your opponent might mistime their meaty or something if they're gonna strike you but it's not gonna be perfectly when you get up a backdash might be a decent option if we back rise on this flip kick knockdown that jury does uh she doesn't get to uh stay up in our grill very well, so she has to go for something like that, that low-medium kick, or maybe a low-medium punch or something. She's not particularly dangerous if we back-tech this, so... Let's mash, uh, back-dash. So if we back-dash, we might get out of this situation scot-free here. Let me do medium kick with Jerry instead. There we go. That's what I, the situation that I wanted to show. So she might reach us with something, but if she doesn't, it's not easy for her to perfectly time her meaty in this situation because she has to walk up, get close enough into range, and then manually time it. So chances are we'll uh, we'll get out of there with a backdash. Backdashing is useful when you can actually create some space, so it's much less good when you're already in the corner. But anyways, going back to the drawing board, I already brought up the stacked of the the risk reward of these situations. Practice breaking throws with delay text to keep yourself safe in a huge number of situations because in general the most common situation is an opponent going for strike or throw, you know? Not just in media, in situations where you're getting up, but like all over the place, an opponent will dash at you and they're gonna do like an attack or a throw or something, you know? You're gonna be constantly in this situation. You'll block a jump in and then you have to get uh, attack or throw. So yeah, practice doing that, but in all honesty, don't sweat it too much right away in real matches. You can just block most of the time when you're starting out and for a while. Sometimes it's hard enough to escape offense even without any throws, you know? You don't need to get away from throws in order to win the game, because throws uh, will not give um, at least uh, regular throws. Command throws are a little different uh, in, in some situations, but yeah. You don't need to do anything. You, you can take every throw that your opponent gets into range to do, and you can still win. Against stronger opponents where you need every advantage you can get, sure, you definitely need to actually guess sometimes and try to be, you know, 
try to make it harder for them to predict and reduce the tendency that they can actually damage you with their offense because statistically, as the defender in that basic RPS situation, you are two out of three, you are at least like 66% likely to be successful to for your defensive option to help you. You know, they have to be the one that beats um because you're always choosing between some option, some defensive option that will beat two or more of your opponent's options. You know, whereas they have to actually use an option that beats whatever your defensive action is. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you can just go in and generally practice playing real matches, and it's totally viable to just say, fuck it, I won't break throws, and then just play matches taking the lowest risk options every single time. See, new players tend to do the opposite. When the pressure is high, when you're on defense, it gets stuffy and you get anxious. That's just inevitability, you know? Like, your your mental state is not always going to be clean and proper. You're way more likely to kill yourself through trying to do too many actions as opposed to doing not enough actions. So I say, when first starting out, relax. Let them throw you when they get the chance until the anxiety melts away and you feel comfortable beating people without being scared of their throws or anything else that they're doing. So, that's like the most basic defense 101. The defensive situation, and you can take those same concepts and reverse them to start uh, to understand offense. Create as many situations as you possibly can where you can throw the opponent, uh, If most characters. I mean, some characters your offense is going to look pretty different, but just pretty much do that. Switch up between attacking and throwing, and keep in mind when it's your turn. And when you're no longer in your ideal offensive situation anymore. Uh, you can't just attack forever all the time, obviously. It'll take a while before the, the opponents you fight uh, will be able to deal with just attacking and throwing. But when they start doing delay techs and that sort of thing, just practice any of the ways that I talked about of getting around that. Such as creating the throw situation and then going for the shimmy. Taking a little bit of a backlog after attacking. And oh, don't worry about the combos or special moves or any of that if you haven't learned how to do those things yet. That doesn't, that shit doesn't matter. We'll cover those too. They're kind of secondary to these basic concepts. When I teach new people how to play, one of the first things I do is I beat my, their ass with any random character and I'm not, without using a single special move or any complex input at all. I just hit, I just understand the situations, take my turns correctly, and hit buttons. All of those things are just more tools that to apply to the fundamental concepts, but it's knowing how to apply your tools that will net you wins. Not being able to use this specific tool or that specific tool, that's not really going to matter until you get to actual um, pressing competition. So, back to the offense. With whatever character you pick, and we'll talk about the characters in a second too, first understand what moves they have that are plus on block, and then work out sequences of attacks that can't be interrupted. That, um... Uh, that you can continue to apply your offense. You don't, you don't need to do the legwork for any of this. This is all very well-documented stuff. Just look up, like, frame traps with your character online. And that is the basic principle of offense. Essentially, when you boil it down, and I, obviously I'm going to talk about this more as we go, you do frame traps, the, the opponent has to sit there and block, and it makes them sit there and block. You trick them you, by taking advantage of this, you move forwards, and you throw them. So take this instance, for example. So as Sakura, if I do standing light punch, I'm plus two, but I'm not in throw range. If I do crouch jab, I'm in throw range, but I'm plus one. And I don't really have any other buttons, like crouch light kick is zero on block. It's even worse. Light kick is minus two, so it's not plus at all. All these moves do not leave me in throw range, so I just have crouch light punch as my, like, tick throw. But it's only plus one, so if I'm fighting a three-frame character, I can't throw them because they can hit me out of that. So in this situation, I have probably, like, uh, I, I would need to move up on them in order to throw them. So I either have to do this, which has not great frame data, and it's kind of hard to turn into a frame trap, or use one of these buttons that's better for creating frame traps but does not leave you in actual throw range another thing that happens with the uh, with Sakura is that she doesn't have great ways of hitting back dashes so if I do like oh standing medium punch crouching medium kick 
They can backdash that. Backdash that. Backdash a lot of these situations. Light punch to medium punch, they can backdash that. That gets an air flip out. So, the thing is, there's lots of ways to defend against Sakura's th uh, throws in close range because she can't, you know, lock you down into a, into a situation where you have to take the guess on the throw. However, because she just moves so fast, see, that's the other thing, is that it's not accurate to think that, oh, you'll just, it's always one of those iron out, like, throw, strike, or shimmy guessing situations. Sometimes you will just not react to the throw in time or time things correctly. And that, it will definitely be the case for Sakura. Sakura moves extremely fast, can get in your face and throw you really, really easily. She'll, you know, by the time you recognize and realize that you can take your turn in this way or that way or anything, she already has other ways to bully you and pressure you and um, take advantage of anything that you, you might be doing. So she doesn't need to have ironed out situations. She will just rapidly approach you and mainly get throws when you're not even prepared to tech on time. When you can throw, you rinse and repeat the guess I already explained between attacking and throwing. Voila. So, I've explained the basic situations of defense and offense for which your entire thought process and what actions you can and cannot take should be wildly different. Now, let's talk about a more complex subject. Neutral. The fucking neckbeards will tell you that neutral in Street Fighter is all about the intricate dance of footsies and buttons and precise movements. So let me start off by giving the autistic summary of neutral. Neutral is the shit that works. If it works, it's good. Please don't worry about playing the right way or forcing yourself into a playstyle that you struggle to emulate if you aren't having fun doing it. Sure, you can respect certain styles of play and desire to be like that yourself, but realistically, you know what's actually more fun over time? Winning. So, from the dry, the cut and dried autistic way of tearing things down and analyzing them, here we go, a very simple situation. I want to be in my ideal offensive situation a whole bunch. I don't want to be in the defensive situation a bunch. That is my basic thought process that I approach the game from. I can be closer to the opponent by walking at them, dashing at them, jumping at them. The same goes for my opponent. So, let's start there. Say he makes the first move. There is a solution to each action. If he jumps at you, you can hit him with an attack that is designed to hit him in the air. If he is moving towards you or dashing at you, you need to start attacking at that space he's trying to occupy. This starts the complex web known as footsies. If you're both basically in range of one another's, of each other's attacks to reach each other's attacks. We won't go into that right now. So basically, just if they move towards you, you can stop them by hitting them. Or if you don't want to take the risk, you can let them move a little closer towards you. Especially if the worst that you'll take is a throw, if they walk up all the way towards you. You can deal with forward movement with both your attacks and your own movement. When they move forwards, you can move away, and it makes it much harder for them to reach you. But it also gets you closer to your corner. The distance you can still move backwards is basically another resource to think about, like how much meter you have or how much health you have left, your V-gauge. So choose to use the distance behind you when you see fit. As for how you play in neutral, well, the first thing you need is a game plan. A basic idea of how you get in on your opponent. Jumping leads to the biggest combos most of the time. It gives you plenty of free offense. It goes over a lot of stuff on the ground. If the opponent isn't anti-airing you, fuck them. That's their problem. And hey, fighting games are situational. And that often refers to how a player's brain functions. Even if a player is anti-airing you when you just walk at him and jump at him, in neutral with like no provocation, you might think that he'll anti -air you all the time, whenever you jump. That is not the case. That might only be in that situation that he's ready for the, the jump and ready for the anti-airs. If you dash and apply some offense, or just like create any substantially different situation, he'll be thinking in different terms on that situation, rather than the nothing is happening neutral situation. You might get away with some more free jumps. Never underestimate the, the power of how much Moment-to-moment -moment psychology affects a player and their immediate skills and their immediate decisions and what they are prepared to deal with. So, with Ryu, let's think of a very basic game plan. If my whole game plan is jump and he anti me every time, well, fuck me, man. My game plan's shot. 
if my game plan is just dash at him, that'll probably be more likely to work. But a lot of new players have trouble moving forwards because they fear they might run into an attack or if they already run into like three or four attacks in a row in a match or something. So if he jumps, anti-air. And when he's on the ground, he's either trying to attack me or in the space in front of him or he's doing nothing. If he If he's attacking or moving, we can strike hit at him, too, by entering the range of our longer attacks, you know? And, and we can throw fireballs, if, we, if we've learned how to do that yet, until he stops attacking. Whatever, you know? We can punch at him if he's punching at us. If we succeed, then he'll stop punching, and then we can dash at him. If, if he's doing nothing, we can dash at him or move up on him. That's, like, a fairly solid basic game plan to get in and apply offense. You know, with Ryu, one of the most basic game plans is throw fireballs and dash forwards. But it's not the only game plan. Say that's not working. Let's say we need a backup game plan. We don't have to win through getting offense. We can play defense and whittle the opponent down. We could throw fireballs over and over, dealing little bits of damage on block, the, the chip damage. The opponent will probably ignore the chip damage at first, but if they block a few more... Even if you, they have the life lead, they'll probably start getting anxious because psychologically, it induces panic. If if the like, if they're losing over like multiple situations over time, you know, if they just take this bit of chip damage over and over and over for like like eight seconds straight, they'll be thinking, oh god, oh god, if I don't do something now, they'll just I'll just get chip damage forever and die. That might not even be true at all, but they'll feel psychologically that it's true then they'll, they'll panic and they'll try to attack you, even if you're not in the life lead in terms of health. You just have to create a game plan that will allow you to... You can create a defensive game plan so long as you can make, like, a couple of seconds in a row, like, short-term memory scenarios in your advantage, and then you can get them to start approaching you. When the clock hits... Not every player. Some players are much more patient, but... When the clock hits zero, the player with more HP wins. So a large part of the flow of the match uh, is decided by who has, who currently has the highest HP. I kind of lied when I said HP doesn't matter. HP is a huge factor throughout the entire match. The player with more health gets to wait around and threaten the opponent who has to get in, perhaps, depending on their toolkit. But the point is, the player with less health has to make up the deficit. But really, it's not about the numbers. Like I said, it's about psychology. Hell. Even frame data doesn't really matter. If you do a move that's negative on block, so long as the opponent doesn't know that, if they think it's plus, it's plus. See, decisions get made because of what people think, not what is actually necessarily true. So even if you're losing badly, you can actually just probably sit, throw fireballs, if the opponent makes no effort to stop you, and the fact that you keep building meter, and the fact that you're dealing chip damage whenever they block one, and the fact that the more used to a pattern the opponent gets, the more they get lulled into this state where they're not really ready for something to change, or maybe they're, like, getting anxious about stopping your patterns. You know, they can be manipulated into acting. And fighting games are fast and stressful. They prey on short-term thoughts. So you can absolutely make a game plan out of just throwing a bunch of fireballs and looking for anti-airs when you expect or when you just see the jumps. See, the reason I bring up the fact that people can be made to make mistakes that will undermine them, even if on paper your game plan isn't that good, is because usually this happens in reverse. As a new player, without a solid game plan, you mostly end up trying stuff at random. And if it works sometimes, you're happy. But then if it doesn't work a few times in a row against a certain opponent, maybe, because you just stopped sort of happened upon your actions, you know, you can also give up on ideas too quickly. The importance of having a game plan is so that you don't fall apart when you play. No game plan is ever going to be a flawless recipe for victory. They're just plans for playing the game. Taking some risks, making some guesses, testing your skills against certain things. It is much, 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 much better for you as a player to have one or two clearly defined game plans for success in your head of how I get from A to B, how I start the match into dealing damage and winning, and to choose a game plan and stick to that game plan even if it isn't working. And you fail against your opponent because, one, you need to test stuff out thoroughly to see what works and what doesn't over time. And two, 
a game plan that you thought of before you started the match, a game plan that you thought of ahead of time using logic will be much better than a shit plan you come up with on the spot if you're losing a little bit. Three, if you don't stick to a game plan, it won't grow. You can't just abandon it and not try to develop it if it needs some slight tweaking around. And four, sometimes it's that psychology thing where you feel like you're losing, but you might not be losing. For example, if you dash straight into like six or seven fireballs in a row from like Ken, psychologically it might feel like you're getting destroyed, but those fireballs don't do that much. They do 60 damage each on their own. They don't knock you down or do much damage or lead to much when you eat them face first. A single successful jumping combo will probably deal as much damage to you as they've done to, uh, uh, to, to them as they've done to you hitting those fireballs getting low, relatively low risk wrong guesses in your game plan because your game plan is ultimately still good. You just happen to be unfortunate multiple times in a row. It's like Kossunk but in reverse. Just because you, you were wrong a few times in a row doesn't change the fact that your strategy is still the good one, a good strategy that's worth going for. So, I'll talk about footsies and fireballs and weird shit and all that later, but basically how you should approach neutral, look at your tools, Make a basic game plan, and then test it thoroughly, commit to that game plan when you play, add more tools to the same game plan if need be, like logically think it out ahead of time, and then apply them. Or, I mean, fundamentally change it if it's just a shit game plan for whatever you're using it for. Make multiple game plans, which each character, uh, which w with the character that you play, so you have backups if one doesn't work for a particular matchup or a particular situation, whatever. Just... Give your play more unpredictability with you being able to switch game plans, but commit to the game plan. Don't do shit that isn't in your game plan. If you want to try something, first work it into your game plan by logically thinking about how you would put it in your game plan sitting in training mode. That's the basic idea.